All right, welcome. In this video, I want to talk about the relationship between pushdown automata and the context-free languages. Without having any uh, indication, we don't really know how these uh, two sets of languages might uh, overlap. Um, the context-free languages we've defined in a previous video is, are those that are uh, generated by context-free grammars. And we spent the last couple of videos talking about the pushdown automata. And uh, the relative power of these two machines is still open an open question. However, um, I uh, am covering this material at the same time because they are, in fact, spoilers, equivalent in power. So this is the theorem then that we would want to prove, that uh, a language is context-free if and only if some pushdown automata recognizes it. So again, there's two directions here we see in the if and only if. This part tells us that not only should, if a, lang if a language is context-free, then there's a pushdown automata for it, but the only if tells us it goes the other way as well, that if there's a pushdown automata, then it must be context-free. Now remember, our definition of context-free is that there's a context-free grammar, so really what we're saying is there's an equivalence in power between these two types of uh, computational models. So we're going to split that, that if and only if into the two directions, and then we're going to uh, address each one um, one at a time, which is a typical way to prove an if and only if. And so I've got them here. So the first one is if the language is context-free, then there's a pushdown automata. That's saying if you have a context-free grammar, then you can make some PDA for it. And then we've got flipped it on its head saying, well, now if you have a PDA, then you can make a context-free grammar for it. So we've split these into the two uh, different lemmas. We'll prove them one at a time. This video will only focus on one of them and I'll do the other one in the next video. So as a little bit of shorthand, we're going to introduce um, this idea that if we want to push multiple uh, uh, elements or uh, symbols onto the stack, um, for instance here XYZ, we might want to push on the stack, we can do them through a, a series of uh, states uh, following the normal pushdown automata model, but we're going to simplify that in our model and just label that as though there's only one state transition here and omitting these intermediate states. So what that means is even though we're still going to only pop off a single symbol, we might be able to push on any number of symbols. And then the, the uh, shorthand uh, suggests, or the way that we're going to use it conventionally, is that on the 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 one that's on the far right side will end up on the bottom of the stack so the x is on the top the z is on the bottom okay so we're going to consider the lemma if the language is context free then there's a pushdown automata that recognizes that what that means is we're going to start with a context free grammar and we're going to try and create a pushdown automata for it and we're going to be doing that by following a very simple uh, construction we'll be creating this machine here that has three states and we're going to use our normal construction to start out we're going to put the dollar sign on and we're going to pop it off before we enter into the accept state however we're also going to put the start symbol of our grammar, the grammar that we assume that we have, uh, onto the top of the stack on top of that dollar sign to get us started. Now why are we going to do that? It's because this machine is going to try and non-deterministically generate uh, the string that we're trying to process or another way of saying that is non-deterministically generate every possible string and then that means the one we're trying to process will also be generated. Now how's it going to do that? Well we're also going to in this uh, second state we're going to put all the rules on there. So we're going to have you know if a uh, goes to W for some string W, we're going to put that on here, meaning if we have some rule that says there's the start symbol goes to, we can replace it with some other string, we're going to go ahead and replace the S with that string. And through this state, because this is an epsilon transition, as long as we have variables on the top of our stack, we can keep processing rules and generate some st string. At, at some point though, we might process that rule and the what will uh, be on the top of our stack won't be a variable anymore. It will be a terminal of some kind. And so that's why we're also going to have this other uh, transition here that says if there's a terminal, any symbol, then if we're actually scanning that symbol and that symbol is on the top of the stack, then we can pop it off the top of the stack. In fact, 
processing that symbol while also eliminating it from this stack and then that might uncover another variable that we can start doing this or more symbols and if we can process all those symbols eventually emptying the stack then that means we will have generated some rule well or sorry some uh starting with the start rule we will have generated some uh input string and that input string will have matched the input string that we were processing that's the only way that we will be able to drain the uh, stack and eventually uncover the dollar sign and enter into our accept state so as it we, as this is the only way we can reach it is with the empty stack we know that if we can reach the accept state there must have been some way of processing the rules of the grammar to get us to this string and therefore it's part of the language of the grammar and then vice versa if there's no way for us to reach the accept state then there must be no way to generate this string with the grammar and so this is just, what we've done here is a proof idea we haven't given a formal proof because the formal proof is a lot more detailed but uh, hopefully with this idea you can kind of understand how the construction works and if not, I want to explore it in just a little bit more detail here. So on the left, I've got a very simple grammar. We've got uh, S, uh, we've got sort of 0, 0, and 1, 1. So it looks like this makes a palindrome. Uh, it's a, even a simpler version of a, a palindrome. It just means zeros on the left matched with one or zeros on the right and ones on the left matched with ones on the right. And then it will also be even length. So I guess even length palindrome is what these generate. I just wanted a very simple grammar because this construction gets pretty messy over here if we have lots of rules and lots of uh, like a, a big grammar. So this is a simple one. Now you'll notice I have just copied each one of these rules over here using the, the construction that was in the proof idea before. We've got S goes to 0S0, for instance, and we've done that for each of the possibilities here. And then we've also, for the terminals that we have 0 and 1, those are the only uh, terminals in this uh, language or in this alphabet, We've also included the rules there. If I scan a zero and there's a zero on the top of the stack, then I can pop it off. So this is the machine that would have been built from this, but let's take a look at it and see maybe how it processes some strings that might be generated by this grammar. So for instance, one of the strings that we might look at is zero, uh, one, one, zero. And here I'm gonna keep track of what my stack contents is. At the moment, it's empty. And we're going to start in our start state. So we're going to start by processing. Uh, and that very first step says put the dollar sign uh, and then the S. And again, I'm going to use the same uh, convention here that the bottom of the stack is on the right. So we've got the S on the top of the stack here. And then we're going to start processing uh, rules here. Now I'm going to do the non-determinism myself. Now we could, the, the way non-determinism is we could follow any of these epsilon rules but only one of them is gonna generate the string that I want, which is 0110. And I know the first rule I'm gonna to need to use is this one to put the zeros on the outside. So I'm gonna follow this rule. That's gonna replace the S that used to be on the stack with 0S0 on the stack. Okay, and now we'll notice that it's the zero that's on the top of the stack. And that also matches the zero that I'm scanning. So the next thing I can do is basically just pop that zero off while processing the first zero in, in our string. Then we are back with an S on top. I need to get to a one next, so I'm gonna follow that next rule, S goes to one S one. And again, sure enough, I have a one on top. And that one is can, can be processed with the one of our input, again, exposing an S. Well, now we're done. We have the one zero we need for the rest of our string, but the S is in the way. So now we're going to pop it off with an epsilon. That just says if you've got an S, you can just get rid of it. And then sure enough, we're going to go ahead and process the one and process the zero. That emptied our stack. It's also processed all of our string. So we can now follow this to the accept state and we can accept. So that's just an example of how this machine that we've created can process a string that would have been generated by our grammar. And I hope that build, fills in the intuition of how we can simulate a context-free grammar with a pushdown automata and thus showing that the languages 
uh, generated by context-free grammars must be contained within the languages uh, accepted by the pushdown automata. That's one of the branches of our uh, two two pronged theorem and I thank you for watching this video and in that next video we'll prove the other branch